Good evening. Hello and welcome. I'm back to do my weekly open discussion slash Q&A. So um, I'm going to wait a few minutes. Hopefully people will um, get the alert, come on in, get settled, and we will see what is on the agenda for tonight. So um, if you're watching this after the fact, then I'm certainly uh, happy for your your time and your attention, and um, I have no idea what we're going to go through tonight, but we'll see. Um, I realize a lot of people are kind of in wait and see mode with the September 23rd thing. Um, but I did post on my uh, my main channel, Heather R, because um, I'm doing this from Heather R too, and then I'll transfer over to my main channel afterward. But I did post um, just a real quick video, it's just a picture, and it has a bunch of verses on it that. Uh, describe or give meaning to the Revelation 12 sign. Tell what it represents, uh, explain why it's in the mid-trib chapters, because it is a mid-trib event. So I realize that uh, there are a lot of people out there that don't want to hear that. They would rather it be linked to September 23rd, 2017, for obvious reasons. So um, regardless, it's there. And um, what did I call it? I think I called it something like the Revelation 12, Great Wonder, the Revelation of the Mystery of God. And it gives the corresponding verses and tells uh, what it is a, going to be a visual representation of and when it will be a, a visual representation of that. <laughs> A uh, specific event. It's not pre trib it's got nothing to do with the church. But again, I, I realize that there are people who, uh, out of principle, will reject it and will give me a thumbs down for even suggesting that or saying that, you know, that's your prerogative. If, if you want to do that, that's fine. But the information is there to explain why um, we may be here past September 23rd because it's not, the Revelation 12 sign is not related to that. It isn't that September 23rd, 2017 is the Revelation 12 sign. It may be similar, whatever. It's not that. Um, and so I, I did upload that. People can take it for what they want uh, or disregard it, reject it out of hand. That's not... <laughs> Uh, that's not my business. I put it out there and so it's available. Hey Katie, welcome. Nice to have you here. And it looks like I've got a couple people here. So uh, for anybody not in chat, hello and welcome. Certainly glad to have you. So we can get started whenever. Um, if we have discussion, we can take it from there, but I don't have anything specific to go through. Um, I kind of did what was on my mind yesterday. Um, so it's open. I suppose <laughs> I should mention the eclipse that happened today. Uh, I worked, there were a bunch of people with glasses that went outside and watched it. I'm in Michigan, so it wasn't, uh, we couldn't see the total eclipse here, but we, we did notice that it dimmed um, and there were people that went outside and watched it, and they thought it was cool. And maybe it is cool. I honestly just haven't really followed it. Part of that is because of all of the auxiliary things that people were saying along with it. And I just, <laughs> honestly, I just tuned it right out. But um, I know a lot of people, even though they didn't believe the end of the world was going to happen today or judgment was going to fall <laughs> on America today or whatever people were saying, 
um, they thought it was cool and they went out and watched it for that reason. So um, one thing to just keep in mind is that we here in the United States, especially those who study prophecy and especially those who have gotten wrapped up in the United States as Babylon and times Babylon and things like that, they have a tendency to make Bible prophecy America-centric. And it's not. It's Israel-centric. And while it's cool that this eclipse happens, uh, happened, you know, in the United States where people could view it, um, Answers in Genesis did a video on earlier today. They do, a, I believe it's Monday and Thursday, they do a Q&A. And they addressed it today. And they said that these total eclipses, total solar eclipses, happen about every year and a half. This one was special because it affected large parts of the United States where typically that's not the case. But they're not rare events. And um, so, <laughs> you know, that's something to keep in mind is that lunar and solar eclipses happen. They just might not happen here, but they still happen. And uh, we just need to make sure that we don't take things out of context so far that people get turned off to them. Um, people took it out of context so far that I got turned off to it and just totally disregarded it because of what people were saying. I just honestly didn't even want to have anything to do with it. And I'm a Bible prophecy student. And so I'm one of the people that um, maybe would be more interested in it than, uh, than a lot of other people simply for the reason that so many people are calling it a sign in the heavens. And they're calling it biblical and trying to assign meaning to it. So if it's turning other people in the prophecy community off when people go so far out of bounds with it, what is it doing to everyone else? Um, you know, we just have to keep these things in mind that uh, perspective, I guess, is what I'm, I'm, where I'm going with that. Get excited about it, think it's cool, whatever, but keep perspective about it. And part of the way to do that is to have a firm foundation in the Bible to understand when these signs will occur, where we're at now, are we in that time period? No. Is it natural or supernatural? Um, and then people say, well, God could supernaturally use a natural sign. But is that what's going to occur in the future? No, it's not. So... We just uh, have to be really careful about what we say and what we put out there because the rest of the world is watching. They might be silent, but they are watching. So we just need to be very careful. Anyway, it happened today. The rapture didn't happen and judgment didn't fall on America. <laughs> and people thought it was cool and will, you know, live to be here another day. So. It just kind of puts some other things in a, a bit more perspective. People get all amped up about comets and uh, asteroids and Nibiru and Planet X and uh, lunar and solar eclipses and celestial alignments. At what point are people going to realize that these things aren't what they want them to be? And so I realize that a lot of ears will be closed to this and a lot of people will just reject it right out of hand because it's not what they want to hear. It's not what they want to have happen, especially, you know, a month from now. I get it. I totally get it. So let's have this conversation then. And um, hopefully what I posted earlier will give people another avenue of study. Um, because right now, when you say anything negative about the signs, people just jump all over you. And I'm no stranger to wanting something to happen. But no matter how much we try to make things fit, if they don't fit, they don't fit. And they're not just going to happen the way we want them to just because we want them to. God doesn't work like that. God's got a plan. And so instead of trying to... Uh, make what we want have happen. How about we try to figure out what his plan is? 
And um, yeah, <laughs> so that's just my two cents about that. But looks like we've got more people here, so hello and welcome. Um, yeah, <laughs> she's a little busybody. Um, so what do we have going on? Anybody have anything on their minds? I don't, um, let's see, I'll check one spot and see if there was anything there. I'm not sure if this link got posted or not, so we will see. Nothing there. So, anybody have anything? Any questions about the video that I did yesterday? Any questions about anything or discussion? Uh, what's going on anywhere with anything? Um, I don't want to waste anybody's time, but uh, I do not have anything pre planned. If the 70th Jubilee is in approximately 2024-25 and the return of Jesus at that time, it seems that the next seven years, it would be hard to fulfill all the things that must take place. Um, there are a lot of people who share that, that there's got to be some kind of a buildup. So um, what specifically are you referring to as far as the things that must take place and trying to squeeze them in that seven years? Um, because I want to address specifically what's on your mind or maybe not yours, but things that you've heard. So what specifically, um, I would be more than happy to address that uh, because it certainly has come up. And that's part of the reason why people believe, um, some people in the prophecy community believe that there's going to be some kind of a gap between the rapture and the start of the 70th week. And it's to build things up. And um, I don't believe scripture supports that. And that's actually going to be one of the things that I study next, is if there is a gap, what amount of time could or would it possibly be? Um, but yeah, so that's part of the reason why a lot of people, some people believe that there's a gap is because they believe that it would be hard to build things up. World religion, world government. Okay, good question. Thank you for asking. So what a lot of people are under the impression of is that when the Antichrist comes on the scene, that he's going to be in a position of power. People speculate that he will be like a leader of the European Union or a leader at the United Nations. And so he has to be established in order to come as Israel's Messiah or to be accepted by Israel. The problem with that is that he doesn't have to be on the world stage. All that is necessary for the covenant to be confirmed is for him to be accepted by the religious leaders of Israel. That's it. He doesn't have to be in a position of power. What the world government and the world religion, those things are built up during the first three and a half years. And the peak of the Antichrist's beast kingdom will be at the midpoint of the week, not at the beginning of the week. He uses that entire first half to build. 
so that his power is peaked at the midpoint, and so he can uh, break the covenant. He can take away the sacrifices and offerings that were instituted. He can declare himself to be above all that is called God. And that's what the transition of power associated to the seventh trumpet is. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned, hast begun to reign. That is Revelation 11, 15 through 17. And so that is going to flip everything that the Antichrist worked to build up to the midpoint on its head. And the very first judgment of the bull, the, the vile judgments, attacks those who took the mark of the beast, causes them to break out with grievous sores and things like that. So there's uh, a very big misconception that he's in a position of power when he comes on the world stage and that all of this stuff has to be in place. But that's what the first three and a half years is building up to. And we see that in Revelation 6 with the opening of the first seal. In Revelation 6, 1 and 2, it says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. The bow is representative of the Daniel 9, 27 covenant. He brings this with him. He confirms it with the many for one week. He's, a crown was given unto him, so that's his acceptance. Uh, he confirms a covenant with many for one week. And it goes back to what Jesus told the religious leaders in John 5, 43. He says, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. So they're going to accept him, and that is evidenced by, and again, this is only Israel that needs to do this, not the world, only Israel. A crown was given unto him. So this speaks of the covenant and the confirmation and his acceptance by the people who uh, Daniel 9.27 says will accept him. What does he do then? Then after the covenant's confirmed and he's accepted of Israel, he goes up conquering and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So he immediately sets up building things. And if he was in a position of power, if he was in a position of world leadership, that would not be necessary. But he's not and he has to get that way. Now, by the midpoint of the week, there's going to be a track record established, and people will have tried to make war with him, and they will have been unsuccessful, which is what we see when he, this is uh, at the midpoint surrounding the abomination of desolation, the deadly head wound, all of that, Revelation 13, and I stood up, uh, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. Well, the ten crowns, or excuse me, the ten, the ten horns, which are the uh, other rulers, other, what will exist uh, at that point. The ones that will share power, give their power to the beast to overcome Babylon, this world leadership that will be in place. You don't see it associated with the beast until the midpoint of the week. When you go back to the previous chapter, when this, the great wonder is talked about, those ten horns, the seven heads and ten horns, are still associated with the dragon. That is not changed. That uh, relationship is not changed. They are not the, the beast when he's given power over all kindreds and tongues and nations and given power over the saints. That's the midpoint of the week. And it's at that point where Satan allows him to continue or gives him power and authority to continue, or gives him his seat. And those ten horns then become associated to the Antichrist, to the beast at the midpoint. So that's where your, your world leadership culminates. Your one world government culminates is at the midpoint of the week when all of this is given to the Antichrist, where he didn't have it before. He was building up to it. And then Satan gives him... Um, the peak of his power, I guess, at the midpoint. And then Jesus systematically takes it away. But when you go to Revelation 13, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion. 
And the dragon gave him, at the midpoint of the week, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly head when he was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So that's where he's got this established track record. When you saw him at the, the opening of the first seal, he went off, he set forth conquering and to conquer. And by the midpoint of the week, the kingdom and all of the authority and the leadership and the seed of his power is given to him and uh, by Satan. And this is what is linked to 2 Thessalonians 2, I believe it's 9. Even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. That's a midpoint of the week, because the, the coming or the revelation of the man of sin is after the removal of what restrains him, which is the law. The man of lawlessness <laughs> is revealed when the law is removed. Because the antithesis of lawlessness is lawfulness. And the Mosaic law and its Levitical counterparts and its statutes and its sacrificial system is all related to the law. When you remove the law, lawlessness is what you have left. And that is what he's called. So that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now let it will let till he be taken out of the way. Till the mystery is no longer a mystery because that which embodies it is revealed. And that is the, in the beast, the man of sin. So, again, in Revelation 6, 1, you have him set up, setting forth conquering and to conquer. He's starting his buildup. And that buildup is complete at the midpoint of the week, and then all the power is given to him, his seat and his authority. The ten horns move from being associated with the dragon to being associated with the beast. And uh, that goes further into Revelation 17, to explain more about that. But all the people on earth worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. They, they wonder, they marvel at this beast. Who is like him? Who is able to make war with him? No one. He's essentially unstoppable at this point. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. There's your abomination, desolation right there. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. Well, what power? Um, it says in verse 2, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Again, it goes back to after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So he's given power to continue 40 and 2 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme the name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindred and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So the one world government and the one world religion will not actually be in place until the midpoint of the week. The one world religion is essentially anything that doesn't recognize Christ. It's paganism. And it's, it's not Catholicism or Islam or Buddhism or Hinduism. It's anything that is anti, antithetical to believing in Jesus Christ. It's paganism. And that will essentially reach its culmination when the mark is introduced, which is also at the midpoint of the week. Because essentially what that's doing is forcing people to choose for Christ or to choose antichrist. And so... Um, your, your one world is basically anything that doesn't involve Christ. And that's why it says that um, those who don't take the mark will be killed. Because that won't be tolerated. So your one world, one world religion really culminates with the mark, which isn't introduced until the midpoint. You say, I take it that Babylon will be literally rebuilt, that it is not symbolic. What is your take on it? It's absolutely a city. It will be rebuilt. There is question about whether it will be original Babylon or if it will be where the um, Tower of Babel was built. 
which may or may not have been in Babel and it may have been further south. So there's questions about what location, um, but yes, it will be, the, the end times of Babylon will be a city, and that's literally the last thing that gets destroyed before Jesus returns. When you go to Revelation 16, after the seventh vial is poured out, and the voice from heaven declares, it is done. In Revelation 16, 18, it says, And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there were, was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty, an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, talking about Jerusalem, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So she will be judged, the city will be judged, at the end of the 70th week, after the seventh vial is poured out, which is the last of the 21 judgments, and right before Jesus comes back. Revelation 17 tells us, uh, the last verse of the chapter, The woman which thou sawest is that great city, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And then chapter 18 talks all about the destruction of the city, and about how all of the craft and the merchandising and the work and the, the food preparation and the parties and the, the marrying and being given in marriage, all of that will cease when she's destroyed. More to the point, she's destroyed by the beast and the ten kings. They give power to him for an hour, and, or they combine all their power, and they hate her and they destroy her. And then the next thing they do is gather uh, together to war against Jesus in the Valley of Megiddo or Armageddon. So, yes, um, chapter 18, if you read through all of that stuff, it makes it real clear that it's a city with merchants and uh, the whole world, having done business with her, is crying. They are um, <laughs> they're weeping. And um, they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, wherein we made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. So yes, she, she is definitely a city. And when you go to Zechariah 5, it tells you that at some point during the 70th week, it will be restored. Um, there is a vision here. Starting in verse 5 in Zechariah 5, The angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes, and see what is that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, is it, it is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, Moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. An ephah is a basket. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. And this is the woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. And he said, This is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. So he put the woman who represents wickedness in the basket and sealed it with lead. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the basket between the earth and the heaven. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? Where are they taking the basket? He said unto me, To build it in the house in the land of Shinar, it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Well, Shinar takes you back to the Tower of Babel, where the original one world leader, one world government, and everything that was antithetical to God existed. And that's essentially the prototype for what will exist again in the end times. But no, there it doesn't there needs to be no gap. There doesn't need to be a gap just to justify buildup or have this person come on the scene. That's what he spends the first three and a half years doing. And it's at the midpoint of the week where all of that reaches its, its height. The kingdom, the one world, the transfer of power to the beast, the ten horns becoming associated to the beast, the introduction of the mark, uh, which isn't going to be, you know, people... <laughs> Whenever there's stuff about microchips and stuff like that coming out, don't take the mark, don't take the mark. We are at least three and a half years away from that because that won't be implemented until the midpoint of the week. More to the point, if there's no beast here, there's no mark of the beast. So uh, not saying that people should get microchipped or anything like that, just that that's a sensationalistic statement. 
and it's one of the things that people need to be careful of that they don't fly off the handle when all this stuff comes up because yes there will be something in the future that people will um should not take because if they do they will drink of the wine of the fierceness of the wrath of god poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and they will have no rest day nor night the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever uh etc etc revelation 14. But they'll be very clear on the repercussions of what they do and still choose to do that if their name is not written in the book of life. Revelation 13 and 14. So it's not as if they'll be able to take it by mistake or that they won't understand what they're doing. Uh, the, the angel that flies, the third angel that flies to the midst of the heavens in Revelation 14 very clearly will warn these people what it is and, and not to do it. Um, and some will choose to do it anyway. But that's the midpoint of the week thing. You said, I believe there is very little time left before the rapture. But how can that city be built up so great to be destroyed in seven years? I don't believe in gap either. That's one of the things where I don't really question the how of it because I don't know. But we do have to consider that there will be a lot of technology that we don't currently have now that when all of these beings and entities are back on earth like they were before the flood um, you know there's there's gonna be a lot of knowledge that comes into play that we don't have now a lot of technology and things like that so I don't know the hows of it um, just that it will happen so I don't I don't know <laughs> I, um, I learned, <laughs> I learned not to question the hows of stuff, um, only because my, my understanding of these things is, is finite, um, and I don't know exactly what will happen after we're gone. I don't know how it will happen. I don't know amidst all the judgments that are going on how it will happen. No clue whatsoever. Um, but yeah, there's definitely going to be supernatural components. Pretty much everything that happens from the rapture and on will be supernatural. Um, <laughs> I don't know to what degree, but yeah, pretty much uh, the world will be the world will be ruled by supernatural beings and things like that. So I, I don't know the hows. Um, I'm sorry, only that eventually it will happen. And I don't know when it will be rebuilt, only that at some point it will be. Wickedness will be established uh, in Shinar, set there upon her own base. So at some point Babylon will be rebuilt, whether that's the original Babylon or whether it's where the Tower of Babel existed. Um, if they're in the same spot or not, I don't know. There's research out there, but I haven't done it. So, But it'll be someplace over there um, on the banks of the Euphrates more than likely. Because when you see some of the trumpet judgments, um, the Euphrates comes into play pretty, uh, well, sort of frequently in the judgments, the trumpets and vials. So there's something just, the Euphrates forms the, the eastern border of the promised land. So when you cross over to it, more than likely whatever is existing that's going to be set up again is going to be right on the other side of the Euphrates. Um... I just, I don't know how it'll all work out. Sorry. <laughs> but good questions. Um, that is absolutely something that's on the mind of a lot of people. And it, like I said, is one of the reasons why there are some um, even really popular prophecy people who believe that there has to be a gap because there's got to be some sort of buildup that this person who's not going to come on the scene until we're gone has to be in a position of power in order for Israel to accept him, and honestly, that's just not the case. I mean, if their Messiah came tomorrow, they would accept him as long as he fits the criteria that they believe he needs to fit. Um, but he'll come on the heels of the Battle of Gog and Magog after God's supernatural victory. That's like literally the next thing that'll happen is the arrival of their Messiah to confirm the covenant. So, um, shock and awe and deception. <laughs> will pretty much rain from that time on. So I don't believe that there needs to be a gap. And the question 
really isn't about what I do or don't believe. It's about whether scripture supports it. And um, it really doesn't. But when you look at the transition from other ages, was there gaps? And if, or were there gaps? And if there were, how long were they? Were there really gaps? Uh, or did we, do we just believe that there were gaps? For example, after the 69th week ended on Palm Sunday, we, many people would believe that the um, dispensation didn't change until Pentecost, while others would argue it happened on first fruits at the resurrection, while others would yet uh, argue that it happened at the cross when he died to uh, shed his blood and the, the broken body and the shed blood. Uh, tokens of the new covenant at the last supper the night before take this is my body which is broken for you this is my blood shed for the remission of sin so some would argue that the dispensation changed on the cross some would argue that it changed on first fruits some would argue that it changed on pentecost um but really was it just that when israel rejected him or didn't accept him in the manner that he came at the end of the 69th week that that was what facilitated this church age which sent him to the cross four days later, because if they had accepted him that day in the capacity that he came, he would have ushered in the kingdom. But they didn't, and it didn't happen. It was delayed. And it was delayed by what? This break between the 69th and 70th week. You remove that. Uh, do you have a gap? Well, I guess that would depend on where people believe the 70th week is going to start. Personally, I believe it'll start on the same day the 69th week ended, which makes the entire, from the end of the 69th week to the beginning of the 70th week, parenthetical, which includes the four days up to his crucifixion, his crucifixion, three days uh, in the grave, resurrection, 40 days to ascension, 10 more to Pentecost, uh, it includes all of that, which is in this parenthetical age, because it's all based on what happened on Palm Sunday, which was the end of the 69 weeks. Israel did not accept him, which set up the rest of the, the course of action that took place. So where does your age stop and where does it start? Um, that's, I guess, not an argument, but that's a topic of conversation. It's, it's discussion. Uh, is it an event that, um, you know, a lot of people gravitate toward, you know, Pentecost, the birth of the church? Or did it happen sooner? You know, where did the age change? Where did the dispensation change? And really, uh, if you're going to look at it from a technical standpoint, it changed when the 69 weeks ended because that was the make or break point for Israel. The make or break point for Israel wasn't four days later when they demanded this crucifixion. It was he presented himself. Um, it goes hand in hand with Exodus 12. The first law given to Israel. It was forward looking to that very day. And the Lord spoke, spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. So, um, and if the, the house will be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it unto the 14th day of the same month, etc. So, Palm Sunday, which was forward looking to, it was the selection of the lamb. It was when Israel was to take for each soul and each household a portion to eat. Um, and that's what it says in verse 3. Take unto, uh, to take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house, un, uh, according to the number of souls in verse 4. So it was for everyone. The selection of the Lamb on that day was forward-looking to when the Lamb of God would present himself to Israel, when they would need to take unto them a Lamb for every household according to the number of souls per household. They didn't on that day. 
when it was their make or break, they chose not to do that. And so that's what set it up for the rest of the activity to occur. Him going to the cross four days later, um, buried for three days in the, uh, and then raised, ascended, spirit, you know, giving him the spirit, all of that stuff. The make or break point wasn't, uh, the, the dispensational change didn't necessarily occur on the cross. That was facilitated by the choice that Israel had to make on the day that they were given the law to select the lamb. First law they were given, Exodus 12, to celebrate the month of Aviv and then what they were supposed to do on the 10th day of the month. So, you know, there's an argument for a few different days. How do you know? <laughs> um, I would... Is there going to be some kind of a gap? I mean, if people believe that the dispensation changed on Pentecost, then they might allow for a 50-day gap because that's 50 days after he rose from the grave. Or Ascension Day is 40 days, or, uh, you know, First Fruits is a few days later. Passover is, a, a, you know, a few days. <laughs> it, I don't know. There's a lot of different people who have a lot of different viewpoints. And so as far as a gap, and then you've got some that say years. Well, clearly, if the Jubilee timeline that uh, I put together is correct, it's totally off the table. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. It's uncertain. It's uncertain to us because we don't know. It's not uncertain to God. So um, that's why a lot of these ideas that people have... Um, you know, maybe they're good to consider, but however right or whatever they might sound or however much sense they might make, we just have to go back to the word and see if it if it makes sense with that, what we're told. But um, I don't know that pretty much the only thing that we're told with regard to the the rapture is that it's the last trump. Last is the Greek word eschatos. It means um, the extreme end. It's the very last thing, the sounding of that trump, the voice of God is it were of a trumpet, calling us to assembly in the clouds is the very last thing that will happen in the church age. So that's where you get into the question, where I get into the question of where does the age end? Because you could have a gap, but what do you call that? Does the Bible support some kind of a time frame between the end of the church age and the beginning of the 70th week? And if so, what would that be called? Who would the people that live or die or are born during that period of time, you know, who would they be? Would they be tribulation saints or not church saints if the raptures already happened? You know, who would they be? Uh, what dispensation would they fall into? More than likely, and this is just from what I can tell, is that you're going to have the rapture and Gog and Magog and the, the arrival of the Antichrist to confirm the covenant. Boom, 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 boom. Um, because I don't know that with the language used in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, what is it? Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Um, yeah, last is the, the Greek word eschatos. So that's the very last thing that happens in the age. It's the extreme end of the age. So when your age ends, you have to have another one that begins immediately. What age will that be that will begin immediately? Probably the 70th week, um, just looking at it from, from that viewpoint. Now, does Revelation support that? We have the end of the church age in Revelation 3, what, 22? And you have the beginning of the week in Revelation 6, 1. So is there some kind of a time period involved in, in 
Revelation 4 and 5, or are you just seeing events in heaven that, um, you know, I, I just, I don't know. So there are a lot of different viewpoints about that, but um, more than likely, there is no gap there. And I'll be talking about this more as I get to writing and in my group, Heather R's Research. Um, I've been kind of starting to post some stuff about this. When you get into Revelation 7, the day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? That's the end of Revelation 6. The day of his wrath is come. The events that are going to happen on that day are all of the preceding texts, which is the opening of seals 1 through 6. Um, that's the first day of the week. When you go to first day of the 70th week, when you go to the next chapter, the question of who is able to stand is answered. You've got, before the trumpets start, you've got the ceiling of 144,000, again, probably on day one, and you've got the church seen in heaven celebrating uh, tabernacling with God in the throne room. Palms, all of that stuff. Tabernacles is a seven-day celebration. This is basically another... Um, comparison to the seven days in the wedding chamber and the seven years in heaven with the Jewish wedding ceremony. We are seeing tabernacling with God. Those removed from the earth, um, according to the promise made in Revelation 3.10, because I was kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the whole world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Well, the ones spared from that trying are 144,000 only who are sealed. And then um, us, because we've been removed <laughs> for that promise. And we're seeing tabernacling with God in the throne room. Uh, and tabernacling is the same word dwell. Therefore they are before the, the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell or have his tabernacle among them. Tabernacles is a seven-day feast. So basically, you're seeing the church in heaven at the beginning for the first day, which is like the seven days in the wedding chamber or seven years in heaven, is another comparison. Another similarity to the, the ancient Jewish wedding ceremony is you have the, the tabernacles being celebrated, not the actual Tishri 15 to 21, the idea of tabernacling, the feast of tabernacles being celebrated. The post that I made in my group earlier was that the Feast of Tabernacles was set in Leviticus 23 because it corresponded to the time when Jesus would take on the form of flesh, become a man to redeem mankind. The Word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us, we beheld his glory, glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then you have the a uh, time he was taken to the temple to anoint the most holy, which was the beginning and the ending of that feast. So you have the um, the seven days right there. Because at the end of the seven days, or seven days after childbirth, when a male child was born, uh, the woman would go to, according to the Mosaic law, go to the temple to be declared clean by the, the priest. So Jesus would have been with her. And Haggai too talks about that prophecy. But anyway... But there are two times that we are given reference to uh, the Jews wanting to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles outside of that seven-day Tishri 15 to Tishri 21 window. The first that we come across is during the Transfiguration in Matthew 17, when the Peter, James, and John were with Jesus on the uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, which some believe was the was Mount Hermon, uh, Mount Hermon. Um, but Peter, when he saw Moses and Elijah with the glorified Christ during the Transfiguration, he thought that the kingdom age was upon them. Because one of the things that's going to happen that he had already spoken at length about, John 5 and 6 talk about this, is the resurrection at the end of the age. So he thought, in seeing Moses and Elijah, he thought that they were being resurrected, and that the, the resurrection at the last day was going to then precipitate the kingdom age. 
And so what did he think in bringing, if the kingdom was going to be brought in at that time, that he needed to, uh, they needed to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's why in Matthew 17, he asks if he should build booths. Um, because booths, when you go back to Leviticus 23, are one of the things that uh, is required in the celebration of the feast. When you also go a few chapters later in Matthew 21, what were they trying to do? When they became aware that the Zechariah 9 prophecy of, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, riding the colt or the, the foal of a donkey. When they became aware that that prophecy was being fulfilled, was going to be fulfilled, because the disciples went into Bethany, Bethpage, uh, wherever that was, to, um, to acquire the animals. Uh, Beth Page. Um, they became aware that that prophecy was going to be fulfilled. And thinking that they were welcoming their victorious king in the messianic era, they uh, had palm branches and they were welcoming him. Well, if you go back to Leviticus 23 again, palms are another symbol or token of the celebration of tabernacles. So, uh, but that was totally not in the month of Tishri. That was on Nisan 10. So basically what the equation is of, of tabernacles is to the reception of the victorious king, the son of David. And that's why they said, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So you have Matthew 17, that was not during the Feast of Tabernacles, but Peter thought that because he was seeing Moses and Elijah with Jesus, with a glorified Jesus in the transfiguration, that um, they needed to celebrate it because the kingdom age was coming. And that's exactly what Matthew 21, they thought the kingdom age was coming because their Messiah, who um, was not coming on a white horse, he was coming on a donkey, they misinterpreted that, um, that Zechariah 9 prophecy. And so they were welcoming him as some, in some capacity other than the one that he came in. So there are two... Uh, two times where they attempted to celebrate tabernacles when they thought the kingdom age was upon them. Their victorious king, their son of David, was coming to save them and to establish his kingdom. Neither time was actually during the Feast of Tabernacles. Now in the Millennial Kingdom, on the seventh day of the 15th month, the seven-day feast will be celebrated. Zechariah 14 talks about this, that all those who are left of the nations will go up year to year to worship the king and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And then Ezekiel 45 also talks about that feast being celebrated from Tishri 15 to Tishri 21, representative of or celebratory of the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Not that there's any legal fulfillment already done. He already came. He already took on the flesh of mankind to redeem mankind. But it'll be celebrating that he did that. Um, but the reference in Revelation 7 isn't necessarily during the Feast of Tabernacles. It's representative of the salvation being provided to the church at the end of the church age. And the church tabernacling, spending seven days in the throne room in the tabernacle of God celebrating the salvation that was just provided to them. Um, so it's just another reference to this, the seven days. More than likely, um, there's just not going to be a, a huge gap, and I just don't think there needs to be. But, you know, nobody needs to care what I think. If there's a different view, then I would love to see, um, you know, where that could be supported. Because that's something that we all question, is how much time in between, will there be any time in between, or will there not be? And then, uh, you know, if there is, how much time, how much time before the 70th week starts could we anticipate being gone? Um, you know, these are things I just don't know. So, but that's stuff that I'm going to be looking at and researching, stuff I'm already looking into, because uh, I will be writing about it. Um, I don't know how soon or whatever, but um, there's actually quite a bit of information. And the thing is that what makes sense to me 
of ways to interpret it might not make sense to someone else. They might come away with a different interpretation. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> we will see. But the information's there. We just have to uh, make sense of it. And that's the question is, am I making the right sense of it? <laughs> um, and that's why I'm not going to write it until after the fall feasts are over. And that way, um, it eliminates any other possibilities unless someone thinks that then we have to wait a whole nother year because they're dead set on the fall. And so we'll wait until the fall is over so it's not even a question, not even a consideration. And um, people are kind of fair weather friends with time of year anyway. They'll basically uh, change their opinions to what's closest. <laughs> And so once fall is passed, then uh, then people will look at the Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah. And then after that, they'll start looking at uh, possibly spring again <laughs> and stuff like that. So, um, but there's, there's a lot we don't know yet um, because there's different interpretations and stuff. So I firmly believe that all that we need to know is there. We just have to make the right sense of it. So... Um, yeah, it all goes down to, it all boils down to, as far as the, going back to your original question, the establishment of the one world government, the one world religious system, um, whether or not there needs to be time for a buildup or all of that. It really just depends on how people interpret Revelation 6 and Revelation 13. Um, when they think that all of the one world stuff has to be in place by. And I don't see that happening to the midpoint of the week. And I see that that's what he uses the first half of the week to do, is to establish all of that. He doesn't need to be in a position of power when he comes to Israel. He doesn't need to be a world leader. He doesn't need to be predominant on the world stage. All he needs to be is what Israel believes their Messiah will be. Because the 70th week is predicated only on the confirmation of the covenant between the Antichrist and the religious leaders of Israel. And once that's done, it doesn't matter what, if the world knows him, if he's known on the world stage or anything like that, he will become known uh, most definitely. And that by the midpoint of the week, uh, who, is like, or who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And they will wonder after him. They'll marvel after him, all of his accolades and everything that he spent those years doing. Uh, they will think he's something great, <laughs> but he's definitely not. So, good. I'm, I'm glad that was helpful. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't get too far off course. Um, but unless you have anything else, um, that's pretty much all I had um, to say about your questions. <laughs> so, is there anything else? Well, thank you all for being here. If you have questions or comments afterward, please, as always, let me know. Thank you so much for being here. And if you're not here watching this after the fact, thank you very much for your time and your attention. Um, I would prefer that if people have negative things to say or disagreement, that you don't just thumbs down, that you actually leave a comment. Um, I understand that a lot of what I'm saying is controversial, and, and there are a lot of people who don't agree. And I'm totally fine with that. But I would prefer that if people are going to disagree, that they would give me something to comment on or to clarify rather than just thumbing the videos down. Because that's not helpful to me to know uh, where people are at or, you know, maybe to explain something better or differently. Um, so I would appreciate the feedback. You don't have to, but um, I would appreciate it. So thank you very much for your time, and have a good night, everybody. And if I don't see you before, then I will see you next Monday. So take care. Thanks.